Hi, today we're going to do another debunking video where we debunk another video of Debunk the Funk. So this is the video we'll be debunking of Debunk the Funk and this is Debunk the Funk. Debunk the Funk runs a debunking channel on YouTube where he produces lots of videos about debunking science basically and this guy is a medical professional who does lots of videos explaining science. So Debunk the Funk produced this video to debunk this guy who is a nursing professional who's been nursing for about 40 years got a PhD. So let's do some debunking. So what does Dr. Campbell do with his YouTube channel? Well, he takes to some authoritative source of science with regard to COVID and then he explains it in a way that numpties like me can understand. Basically, that's what he does. So what is Dr. Wilson's from Debunk the Funk? What is this problem with Dr. Campbell? Well, let's hear. His videos have fueled conspiracy theories being shared among conspiracy circles that include anti-vaxxers and COVID deniers. Anti-vaxxers and COVID deniers? That sounds serious. Let's see what Dr. Campbell says. Better than no vaccine. Very, very good levels of protection. The vaccines being safe, looking there safer to get the vaccine. Protection from the vaccine. 100% effective at preventing severe disease and death. And that the people that are being hospitalised and going into intensive care are in the unvaccinated group to get vaccinated. And the vaccines did save a lot of lives. The immunity, as we say, is only from vaccines. Vaccination for you, Gary, is absolutely essential. Vaccine is providing a high degree of protection. So if you have a booster dose, of the vaccine, you're going to reduce your chances of hospitalisation by about 90%. Being protected from severe disease by two vaccines and a booster dose of the vaccine. Younger age groups really need to be thinking about vaccination. Well, that looks like Dr. Campbell's being very pro-vaccination. So why would his videos be shared amongst active actors? Maybe Dr. Wilson's looking for clickbait. Where's the clickbait? Where's the clickbait? Oh, there it is. Oh. Well, now we can talk about one of Dr. Wilson's favourite all-time subjects, and that is... Conspiracy theories. Yes, you heard it. Conspiracy theories. Woohoo! Well, where would those conspiracy theories come from? Let's take a look. Well, maybe these conspiracy theories are being driven by Western powers pressurising the GP who discovered the Omicron variant to say that the disease is more serious than it really is. Perhaps that drives conspiracy theories. Maybe some of the conspiracy theories find their inspiration from Pfizer. For example, how about this? When a whistleblower talked about the dating integrity of Pfizer's vaccine trial. What did they say? They said a whole bunch of things, but let's have a look. They said participants were placed on hallways and not monitored correctly by staff. Lack of timely follow-up of patients who received adverse events. Ooh. Protocol deviations not being reported. Vaccines not being stored at proper temperatures. Mislabeled laboratory specimens. And targeting of staff for reporting their concerns. Maybe that's part of the ingredients for COVID conspiracy theories. Maybe it's because we went from this. Do get a breakthrough infection when you're vaccinated. The chances of you are transmitting it exceedingly low. So low likelihood of transmission, low likelihood of getting infected. To this. The fact that vaccinated people who do have a breakthrough infection are clearly capable of transmitting the infection to an uninfected person. To this. So if you are trying to, you know, get at me, you're really attacking not only Dr. Anthony Fauci, you're attacking science. And don't forget the letter of the Lancet that called people who said the virus came from a lab conspiracy theorists. Or maybe it's because it started like this. COVID vaccine is safe and effective. Safe and effective. Safe and effective. Is safe and effective. And now it's like this. For serious side effects. It's vaccine injury support program. Paralyzed from my chest down. Life altering injuries. Did the right thing trying to help everybody else and they're not helping her. So is there any historical reason why we should mistrust Anthony Fauci or the medical establishment? Well, let's have a look what happened in 2009 with the swine flu pandemic. So back, I'm sure you can remember, in 2008 and 2009, there was a swine flu pandemic and people were developing vaccines for that too. So what happened? 
In 2009, Anthony Fauci appeared on YouTube to reassure Americans about the safety of the swine flu vaccine. The track record for serious adverse events is very good. It's very, very, very rare that you see anything that's associated with a vaccine that's a serious event, he said. Hmm, what else happened? So a similar story was played out in the UK. Prominent organisations, including Department of Health, British Medical Association, the Royal College of General Practitioners were working hard to convince a reluctant NHS workforce to get vaccinated. We fully support the swine flu vaccine programme. The vaccine has been thoroughly tested, they declared in a joint statement. Except it hadn't. Eight years after the pandemic in Fraser outbreak, a lawsuit alleging GlaxoSmithKline's pandemic vaccine caused narcolepsy has unearthed internal reports suggesting problems with the vaccine safety. Internal reports where well, they knew there was problems with the vaccine safety, but they still rolled it out. Let's see what happened on Wikipedia. The fountain of all knowledge. Pandemics was found to be associated with narcolepsy from observ observational studies. Oh, that sounds familiar. Increasing the risk of narcolepsy from five to 14 times in children and two to seven times in adults. Observational studies is where people are reporting diseases that they observe. That sounds familiar, I would say. What do you think? A nurse committed suicide after developing narcolepsy after receiving a vaccination. She was required to be vaccinated against her wishes in order to keep her job as a nurse. That doesn't sound at all dodgy, and that doesn't sound at all like history is repeating itself, does it? Governments made various legal arrangements to shorten the time for production of the vaccine and administration of that vaccine to the population. Oh, that sounds familiar. In countries such as Canada, not Canada again, UK, France and Germany, one element of those arrangements was to provide vaccine manufacturers with indemnity from liability for wrongdoing, thereby reducing the risk of a lawsuit stemming from vaccine-related injury. Now, to me, why would a company such as Pfizer, who reckon their vaccine's really good, require indemnity from liability, as if they didn't have much confidence in that vaccine themselves? So, after this history of the pandemic's vaccines, what did Anthony Fauci say about the speed with which the COVID vaccines were developed? The speed was a reflection of extraordinary scientific advances and did not compromise safety, nor did it compromise scientific integrity. So these extraordinary scientific advances that did not compromise scientific integrity also didn't uncover that the vaccine doesn't stop infection, that it doesn't stop transmission, and that the vaccines do not stop asymptomatic disease. These great scientific advances also didn't uncover that the vaccines cause blood clotting, that the vaccines cause myocarditis, swelling of the heart, and pericarditis. And then, once you've found that out, and if you decide from your own free will that you don't want to take the vaccines, they then demonise you, take your job away, take your money away, and even shut down your bank account in Canada. Anyway, back to Dr. Wilson. What else is he debunking? And moving on to John Campbell's most recent and arguably most egregious mistake on his YouTube channel, at least that I know of, we come to this idea that COVID-19 death certificates that only list COVID as the cause of death are the only true COVID deaths. The background of this is that Dr. John Campbell was talking about a freedom of information request which showed there was only 17,500 people who died from COVID that only had COVID on their death certificates. What he doesn't seem to understand here is how death certificates are filled out. If there is no underlying cause, that doesn't mean the person is healthy. If there is nothing else on your death certificate other than the thing that killed you, I think it probably does mean that you're healthy, except for the thing that killed you. So you were healthy before that. When it comes to filling out death certificates, Take COVID-19 as an example. This is the norm of what you would see. This is not the norm of what you would see. And this is also the most egregious mistake. But we'll come to that in a minute. You would see someone who maybe died of respiratory failure. This respiratory failure would be a cause of pneumonia, which would be a cause of COVID-19. This kind of death certificate would not be included in the count that he is talking about where COVID-19 is the only cause of death listed. Well, I'm afraid it does mean something in this context. In fact, quite a lot. Let's explain. So when we look at the COVID death figures in the UK, 
we'll see that there's 160,000 people that have died from COVID or with COVID, as they say. But that is calculated by all cause mortality within 28 days of a positive COVID test. So because they're counting all cause mortality, we can now create four boxes that we can fit the our analysis into. First box is how many people died from falling out of windows? Nothing to do with COVID, nothing to do with pre-existing conditions. Group two, how many people have pre-existing comorbid, like a dodgy heart or bad lungs? They got COVID, COVID pushed them over the edge. Third question, how many people got COVID, then developed comorbids like pneumonia and then died? And then finally, how many people died from none of the above, which is 17,500? Let's look into the other ones. Firstly, let's talk about incidental deaths. These are where people tested positive for COVID, but they died from falling out a window, car crash, whatever else it may be. Don't know what that number is. So let's move those to one side for the time being. It's probably a very small number. Let's not worry about it. Next category is people who died from pre-existing comorbids like obesity. The often national statistic has kindly kept a track of pre-existing comorbids. So let's take a look. So this chart prepared from data from the Office of National Statistics is showing percentages of deaths against comorbids, pre-existing comorbids. Most people die from long-term chronic diseases and then they get COVID and perhaps it's COVID that pushes them over the edge. Or at least we know at the point they died, they already had these conditions and they failed a COVID test 28 days ago. We have to go all the way down to 1% before we find influenza and pneumonia, which was example Dr. Wilson gave. It's a very small percentage of people that actually die because of COVID, as opposed to dying because of a previous condition that COVID caused them to die with. If you see what I mean, I think you do. I think the death rate for COVID globally is 0.8%. So of that 0.8, only 1% from that 0.8 die from COVID. So what does that mean in our figures for the UK of the 160,000 people that have died? So 1% are dying from influenza. That's 1,600. And we've got the 17,500. So that means in a population of 70 million and we've had 160,000 deaths, only 18,600 of those deaths or say 20,000 of those deaths round up a little bit, be a bit generous. 20,000 of those deaths were caused by COVID and COVID alone, which is quite low in our population of 70 million. Next. Ivermectin. Oh shit. He seemed to be promoting this idea that Ivermectin was effective in treating COVID. Right, so a recent study came out from Japan which shows that Ivermectin has a, shows an antiviral effect against Omicron. There is another website which is all about um, tracking all the studies on that have been done on Ivermectin. They find that here you look at relative risk. They're finding that it's all pretty safe, so it's low relative risk. Favours ivermectin, as you can see down here. And then here we have all studies, 64% improvement. Right? And that breaks down into mortality, ventilation, ICU emissions, whatever else it may be. Quite good numbers, I would say, pretty much all the way down. Then we have this site here, Pub, um, PubMed. Right? So this is, um, anyway. So here's a study, Ivermexin for prevention and treatment of COVID-19 infection, systematic review, meta-analysis, blah, 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 blah. When was this study published? It was published 14th of February, 2022. So not very long ago. And what did they conclude? They concluded moderate, with moderate certainty, evidence find that large reductions in COVID-19 deaths are possible using Ivermexin. Using Ivermexin, Early in the clinical course may reduce numbers progressing to severe disease. The apparent safety and low cost suggests that ivermectin is likely to have significant impact on SARS-CoV-2 pandemic globally. So that's their conclusion. Now I want to take you something else that I think is even more interesting. So first things first, there's two types of doctors. One is a research doctor. The other is a medical doctor. So medical doctors or physicians are there to make you better when you get ill. Research doctors tend to try and work out how your body works and then develop new drugs for pharmaceutical companies. 
So their focus is on something completely different. So what were the physicians doing when the COVID outbreak hit? So as you would expect, a lot of the physicians, when they say I've got patients coming to their hospitals, they started trying to work out what would help their patients the most. They started talking to each other, arranging groups from other hospitals and sharing information and sharing advice. And one of those was called the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance. And they developed two protocols one for early pre-hospital and outpatient treatment, another one for in-hospital treatment when you got really bad. And this is what they had to say about ivermectin. Efficiency of ivermectin. Ivermectin is a medication uniquely suited to treat COVID-19, given its now well-described potent antiviral and anti-inflammatory properties. That's a good thing, isn't it? The efficiency of ivermectin is supported by the results from 64 controlled trials. 32 of them randomised and 16 of those were double-blinded. The gold standard of research design. Woo! So that's really what I want to say about ivermectin. You know, physicians use it. Research scientists don't like using it because it doesn't make the fucking man any money. There is one thing that I want to address. He does complain a lot about this document Dr. Campbell reviewed on one of his sites, which was an abstract for something that was going to a conference. And the nature of his complaint was that the doctor, Dr. Campbell, was talking about something that hadn't been peer reviewed. That just because it's been, hasn't been peer reviewed, or just because it has been peer reviewed, doesn't mean to say that it's available for public disinformation or public information. The science belongs to everybody, not just to the scientists. Science is a process, not a qualification. There is plenty of science discoveries that have been made by non-scientists. And there's plenty of scientific progress which has been stumped and held up by scientists. Let's just leave it there. But at the end of this video, let's put in some stats, which is why it's important to know what is actually killing people. Okay, here's some stats. Science is a process, not a qualification. If you thought science was for the facts, then you are wrong. Science is a process of discovery. At its core is asking questions, and it is far better to have questions that can't be answered than to have answers that can't be questioned. Dr. Wilson, instead of engaging with the science, the questions and uncertainties, uses his qualifications to set himself up as an expert to debunk those with far better and more relevant knowledge and qualifications and experience than he has. Dr. Wilson's debunking is all about supporting the official narrative. It's like a child trying to convince his dad that Santa Claus exists. Two of the most important sentences in science are, I do not know, and how do I disprove that which I think I do know? Those sentences and the modesty which comes with them are the backbone of all scientific discovery. They are the words that you will not hear Dr. Wilson say. They are the words etched in the hearts of people like Bertrand Russell, Albert Einstein and Richard Feynman. Finally, let me say something about good science, bad science and leadership. Good science requires openness and honesty. Those studies where they gave ivermectin after COVID was established in the patients is not good science. Those pharmaceutical companies that publish only the results they look for but hide the failures is not good science. The Pfizer vaccine trials where only the analysis is published but the underlying data which Pfizer went to court to stop is not. That is not good science. Those leaders like Fauci and Jurazek who try to demonise those that ask questions are not good leaders, nor are they honest scientists. And those communicators like Dr. Wilson, who only support the official narrative, who don't look for the gaps and the unknowns, are probably the worst because they promote fake certainty. They promote the denigration of those who dare to ask. They cancel the comfort of ignorance. They say, do not ask questions. We will tell you all you need to know. But in science, we are all free to ask questions. We are all free to be scientists. 
to question the narrative, to question experiments and to question the conclusions. For that is how we shine a light into the darkness. While people like Dr. Wilson are counsellors of the shadow, counsellors of fear, ignorance, servitude and despair. See you next time, folks.